Welcome to uh, an episode of Repairs to this Triumph TR7. Now for those of you who have been watching my channel, you'll know that I've been working on my Triumph Dolomite Sprint Rally Car restoration. And I was determined not to touch the 7 until the dolly was finished. Unfortunately, through all sorts of things beyond my control, there's these endless, endless delays on working on the dolly. So I've decided, somewhat reluctantly, to work on the 7 in between time. Um, only because I'm obsessed with having too many of my cars in a million pieces at once. I've been down that rabbit hole once before and you know, I don't like it. But anyway, I'm doing it. And so what's wrong with the TR7 now? It's not a restoration. The TR7 is just repairs. Now it's been off the road for three years I guess. Um, just because of circumstances and, and not being used. It was my road car for, I don't know, 25 years or more. Um, and now, well, it's not. <laughs> um, now the problems it has, well, one of them is uh, due to three years off the road, that's the power booster dying. Now, through experience, I know that master cylinders often die very soon after you uh, you know, if you let them go dry for any period of time. So pulling the power booster off meant the master cylinder would be sitting around for a few weeks while that was rebuilt and would then dry up and probably fail. On, and, and it's a 40 year old car and it's still the original master cylinder. So it's getting rebuilt as well. So uh, that I've already pulled those off and they're gone off to be uh, repaired. Um, I bought a one of these anti-dive kit. It's like a packer that goes under the front sway bar. Um, so I'll fit that at some point. Uh, it has, hasn't had an oil change for a long time, so I'll change the oil and filters. Uh, the other problems it has, well, the steering is as heavy as all hell. I don't know how I drove it for 25 years uh, when I drove it from where it was stored to uh, this new place uh, about 18 months ago. I couldn't believe how, how heavy the steering was. Uh, so I bought an electric conversion kit. Um, that needs to be fitted. I can't fit that till the power booster's back on because I suspect this kit thing's going to be in the way. Um, on the rear end, the nylosane end in the front, the nylosane sort of bushes, I suppose you'd call them, where the spring sits. So it's not steel on steel. Um, they used to be rubber. And anyway, that, that nylosane, I was cleaning up the shed and I saw nylosane laying under the seven. I thought it was going to be suspension bushes, but it's turned out to be these top and bottom of the springs. And so I don't want to um, sort of, I'm waiting on those parts as well. The other thing I've got is a camber and caster adjustment sort of kit that goes at the top of the spring here so therefore until those bushes arrive I won't be doing that job either. Um, that means pulling the whole front strut assembly out and putting this on and putting it back together. And um, I'm chasing a, uh, a steering shake. Um, not the, the traditional TR7 at 80Ks steering shake. I can, I've lived with that. It's only minor. This is a put your foot on the brake and the whole car bloody <laughs> shakes itself to bits. Um, and I don't know where it's come from. I, and that's one of the reasons the 7 went off the road. Because I spent 18 months chasing that problem and getting absolutely nowhere. There is basically not a single component in the front suspension and steering that hasn't been replaced. Now I know the power steering is not going to fix that. Uh, but the camber adjuster might. Um, <laughs> some expert sort of theorised about the, the caster particularly. Uh, look, I don't know, but I'm going to give it a go. I've tried everything else, so I'll try that as well. Um, the fuel gauge is not working, which I 
I've done one before. I suspect. Look, I, I don't remember it such a long, long time ago. Um, but I seem to remember having to, like, drop the diff out to get to the fuel tank. So, again, until those bushes that hold the spring in, because the, in the rear end, the, the springs actually, the car's been lowered a bit, and those springs are a bit shorter. And so they're actually come out now that I've jacked the car up because just that little bit of bushes that are gone. So if the diff does have to come out to do the fuel gauge, I'd, I'll do it once I get those bushes back. And the final job I think I'm toying with, haven't decided yet, having put disc brakes on the back of the dolly and, and it, it's so nice. Um, um, look, I, I know that drum brakes and disc brakes on the back of a car like this is not really doing much. Um, yeah, most of the braking is done at the front, but it's nice to have. Um, and I've seen on YouTube a guy doing a MGF component sort of conversion, the rotor and the caliper, and then making a bracket somewhat similar to what the dolly's got. And I've seen a few conversions, but uh, look, keeping the 13 inch wheel um, and but a lot of those conversions are, are cars that weren't sold in Australia uh, like the Dolly's got Ford Sierra well, we never got those out here so uh, MGFs are reasonably common-ish and so I can probably find some second-hand uh, calipers and rotors to use as um, sacrificial lambs to see whether it will work it looked a pretty simple conversion. Uh, certainly putting the rotor on was a pretty simple looking conversion. Uh, a little bit of machining, but nothing much. It'll be making the bracket for the, the caliper and where the caliper goes around the disc um, so that it, the handbrake will work and what have you. So I, I'm toying with that. I quite like the idea, but um, so I probably will try and source some MGF stuff and, and I might do it. Yeah, why not, eh? <laughs> um, alrighty. So that's about it. So what I'm going to do today is put this uh, anti-dive kit on the front. Uh, there is someone sort of thought that might change the the sort of shake in the steering. I think it's highly doubtful, but I'll, I'm doing it anyway. Um, this car, even though it looks like a rally car, it's not. It's a TR7. Okay, it's got a sprint motor and and what have you, and, and a brake conversion on the front, um, but it's not a rally car. But it's certainly been used for like navigational rallies. So there's a howler and a terror trip in it, and, and it's got a sump guard on it. I, I own four cars, and all four cars have sump guards on them. I'm a country boy. I lived, grew up living on dirt roads, and it's just something that I do. Um, so the sump guard needs to come off so I can change the oil and the filter. I also done a modification to get air to the radiator. It's like a shield thing. And there's an oil cooler but there's also a, a, an additional oil filter. And that's hidden up under that shield. So I've got to take that shield off to do that as well. And so I'll do all that. I'll do the anti-dive kit. And the other jobs will come in future episodes. So let's get on with it. Alrighty then, let's get this uh, sump guard off. It's been a while. Yeah, one of the problems, you know, of um, getting other people to work on, on your cars I've never one been a great one for that, but I've had to in recent times, and and some things I can't do, and that's um, exhaust systems welding. Um, years ago, I had this car. Uh, there was a pinhole in the exhaust. It was just a tiny little hole, and it just needed a bit of welding on it, maybe a bit of one mil, one point six, whatever the you know that that thin body metal put over it and, and, and welded over it, a little patch. Um, that's what I intended to happen. 
So I took the sump guard off because it was under the sump guard. It had been scraping on speed humps and what have you. Um, so I took it off, took it to a, a mechanic sort of thing and said, no, fix that for me. So the sump guard's off, I'd done the work for him. Well, I pick it up, I drive it home and they uh, had very kindly rotated the tyres for me. Um, now I don't rotate tyres, I'm not a great one for doing that. Uh, sometimes I'll move back to front but I won't rotate them around the way they do. Um, anyway, I took it home and somewhat irritatingly had to rotate them back. Well, and I had to put the sump guard back on. Well, I jack it up and they'd welded what amounted to a, oh, I don't know, um, more than a quarter inch piece of like metal to this exhaust. And that then fouled on the sump guard. Um, and it then took me a whole weekend's work to modify the sump guard to try and, you know, I ground away at it and, and, and then I had to modify the sump guard which basically meant packing it down and losing a bit of ground clearance um, so that it no longer sort of would rub and rattle on the, on the sump guard and then it didn't want to line up properly I had so much trouble with that um, and I've still got a scar from where I hurt myself doing it and I sort of think, well, what possessed them? <laughs> You know, and this happens all the time. The other thing that happens when I take cars to mechanics is they bloody break them. I don't know how they manage to, but they break them. Um, yeah, I don't know how they do that either. Yeah, it's amazing how mechanics can break things. Like my Toyota was uh, recently in to have its distributor rebuilt. Now, the distributor's in the engine bay. <laughs> And I get it back, and some of they'd meant to bend the steering wheel. Uh, I know it's a hard car to get in and out of. Um, there was a knob off the fan that works the fan in the air conditioning thing. That was on the floor. Um, and the plug that plugs in the, the nav man and, and what have you into a... It's, it's ultimately into the cigarette lighter. Now, I've since worked out why they did that is because it also works the um, dash cam and apparently mechanics um, do that. I never would have crossed my mind, but apparently, according to someone I was talking to, they always disconnect the dash cam so that, um, you know, if they're doing something inappropriate in your car, they don't get caught, you know, hooning around the street or something. I, I don't know. It never crossed my mind, but uh, anyway... That was disconnected as well. It was, yeah, um, saved me from mechanics, eh? But some things you have to do, like bloody welders. Now, what do I need? Now, Triumphs don't leak oil, of course. We all know that. But uh, any oil that might fictitiously come out of the engine or gearbox falls onto the sump guard and if you put some literally nappy material on the sump guard um, that oil gets absorbed in there and you don't leave any telltale oil leaks on the road <laughs> well it's time to change the oil hasn't had an oil change in years hasn't been started and driven so but I figure it needs some new oil in it now this TR7's got a uh, spin-on filter on it. Um, it uh, has done for a long time. I have no idea what the filter is off. Um, yeah, now this shield here um, is just to try and get the air go through the radiator instead of down under the car um, and something I did it 
it's uh, not going to win any sort of design awards. I have to give it to people who can make things, whether it's brackets or um, you know, something like this thing that not only do the job but look alright. I can't do that. Everything I made looks made. <laughs> um, now does that matter but uh, you know some people have the ability to fabricate a bracket or something and it just looks uh, but that's not me does happen with this sort of sump plug the oil used to leak around just through the threads if you like so I put a bit of plumber's tape on it and I put it back in now this is an intelligence test on how to do this and I invariably get it wrong I'm always get it wrong really so if you if the thread is so it's got to go around, got to go around that way. Well, it's time to put a mark on the wall there because that's got to be one of the first times I've ever done that right. Now to save the car pumping this filter full, I'll put some oil in it first. Doesn't seem to matter how careful you are with putting mucking around with oil. You invariably spill some somewhere. <laughs> like that. Alright, let's look at this anti dive kit. Which is like an aluminium packer. It goes up here under the sway bar, pushes the sway bar down. Now years ago I made one myself. It's oh, only about a third of that in thickness, I'd say. Yeah, about a third of the thickness. So um, it's not as far down. So I'm going to put this one on and just see how it goes. <laughs> uh, don't you love it? The uh, new one comes with... Uh, metric bolts but uh, the uh, TR7 is a real mishmash of, of um, imperial and metric and I suspect that is imperial I'm saying it's a 16 millimeter but I strongly suspect that's not Let's see if we can find the right one. Well, still gonna put the sort of shield thing on and the sump guard back on. I might think about that because they might be in the way for other jobs that are gonna happen over the next while. So I might actually leave them off for now. Well that's about it for this episode of repairs to this poor old Triumph TR7. 
tune in, same duck time, same duck channel, for more mechanical mayhem on this poor old TR7. When you'll see me fit some camber caster adjusters to the top struts, hopefully. Bye for now.